Director of uh, Urban Spatial Planning for Biodiversity Conservation and Preservation. My name is Hossein Fadai. I'm the head of the EMG Secretariat. Um, I'm very honored to uh, be here with you today and with our uh, <clears throat> excellent panel. I'm so much uh, revealed to, to see uh, that we have uh, experts, colleagues uh, uh, from the UN system, and also co colleagues uh, and friends from uh, academia and also from uh, countries attending this discussion. Um, I just would like to say a few words uh, in welcoming you, and then I will hand it over to Paola Deda, who has kindly accepted to moderate this uh, debate. Um, just a few words to say that this series of webinars on um, biodiversity integration or implementation of the UN Common Approach on Biodiversity is being organized by the EMZ Secretariat in collaboration with the uh, respective UN entities in order to promote the understanding of the importance of biodiversity integration in key um, uh, areas um, of um, uh, development, uh, uh, food security, uh, education, um, and and, uh, and and in areas such as human rights, where we feel we need to uh, make sure that there is a good understanding of the interlinkages, uh, relevance, uh, and that there is uh, an adequate uh, awareness raising. Uh, in, in order to make sure that not only the experts and the organization in those sectors, but also their constituencies are paying more and more attention. This uh, series of webinars are uh, being held in the context of the EMG issue management group on biodiversity, and it's two working groups uh, that are um, uh, working on uh, two specific uh, um, sort of dimensions of, of the implementation of the common approach. One is on um, awareness raising and knowledge management on biodiversity, and the second one is on monitoring and reporting and accountability aspects of this um, uh, common approach. As many of you know, this uh, common approach on biodiversity is a very important framework, a result based a structure that the UN system has uh, developed since 2021. And uh, this is one of those long term structures uh, and uh, framework that have, has been accepted by 52 UN member agencies plus IUCN and WWF as a framework that helps um, integration of biodiversity at uh, three levels of um, vision and policy uh, management at a level of uh, programming and also at the level of delivering on the ground. Uh, we hope that through this tool, we, the UN system is more organized, uh, coherent and responsive to um, integration implementation of the global biodiversity framework um, at different levels and that there is more uh, resource allocation, resource mobilizations, uh, and also awareness raising by all of the UN system in, in support of the GBF. Uh, so I'm very delighted to be with you here. Uh, I'm very uh, sort of relieved to have experts uh, who will speak to this specific topic. One of the um, expectations also that we have in these uh, webinars is um, also to hear the stories from agencies who have successfully uh, started this process of integration, uh, to share their lessons learned with those agencies that might have for any reasons not been able to integrate and to adopt um, and then trying to see what opportunities exist for interagency collaboration amongst these, these agencies. We uh, thought of focusing on some uh, crucial areas where we feel uh, are um, those areas that would uh, also support implementation of the SDGs especially those transition areas uh, relating to food security, to poverty and um, and uh, areas where less uh, reflections and perhaps less understanding has been created for such as the one of the um, um, you know urban urbanization and the special planning where we feel there's a lot of opportunities 
so I'm very uh, sort of happy that we have colleagues from UN Habitat. I'm very thankful to them who have uh, raised this uh, and have uh, sort of pioneered to, to, to support this webinar. I'm very happy that Paolo has accepted to moderate this. I know her background in architecture, but at the same time in forestry and other uh, environmental domains, and I felt nobody better than her to be able to moderate this excellent uh, sort of uh, webinar and, and this panel. I stop here. Um, with your permission, and uh, Yannicka, if I'm doing the right protocol, I would like to directly hand it over to Paola to guide us through this discussion. Over to you, Paola. Thank you, thank you very much, Hossein, for these welcoming words and this explanation. Well, uh, dear panelists and ladies and gentlemen, it's actually my pleasure to welcome you to this event on urban spatial planning for biodiversity conservation and preservation which is jointly organized by the Secretariat of the United Nations Environment Management Group, the EMG, in collaboration with the United Nations Human Settlements Program, UN Habitat. As Hossein already mentioned, I'm Paula Deda, I'm director of a division that is dealing with both biodiversity as well as cities. So uh, this webinar to me is, is actually very relevant. Um, and um, my, I work at the UN Economic Commission for Europe. I'll be the one guiding you throughout the, the today's events as moderator. Today's event kickoffs actually a series of webinars and exchange events that will be taking place throughout the year as part of the activities of the EMG Issue Management Group on Biodiversity, with the general objective of increasing awareness and knowledge on the UN common approach to biodiversity and strengthen interagency dialogue and cooperation on the implementation of the Global Biodiversity Framework, the GBF. In particular, today's event focuses on cities and urban areas and is aimed at raising awareness on the need to take urgent action to preserve and conserve biodiversity at an urban and peri-urban level as well as promoting awareness and implementation of the UN Common Approach to Biodiversity. Uh, in addition, uh, today we will exchange best practices and lessons learned from the implementation of spatial planning actions that contribute to biodiversity conservation in different cities and regions across the world. For this, we are happy to have a wonderful international panel of experts that will share the experience of concrete actions being implemented in Nairobi, Kenya, Santiago, Chile, and San Jose, Costa Rica. Um, now, without uh, further ado, I'm pleased to pass now the floor to Mr. Andrew Rudd, Urban Environment Officer at the UN Human Settlement Programs, UN Habitat, to give us a key setting uh, the scene presentation on the coming Montreal Global Biodiversity uh, Framework, the GBF, and challenges for addressing biodiversity loss in urban and peri-urban areas, as well as uh, UN, the UN con contribution by implementing the UN Common Approach to Biodiversity. Just two words of background, Mr. Rudd uh, holds a, a Master of Science in City Design and Social Science and a Bachelor in Architecture. It was, uh, he has a vast experience in urban planning and public space, as well as concept development, project management, policy formulation, advocacy and pol political negotiation, particularly regarding sustainable cities. So, dear Andrew, the floor is all yours. Paolo, thanks so much. I'm humbled by that introduction and delighted uh, to be working with all of you on this. I, I think as a scene setting, uh, it, it's really worth noting that it wasn't so long ago that mention of the term biodiversity uh, amongst our urban crowd was met with a lot of blank stares. And equally, uh, any mention of spatial planning or of space in general amongst our ecological colleagues elicited questions uh, as to whether we were talking about outer space. So I think it's worth at this point being proud in a way of the connections we forged that we've uh, been able to uh, come together on this particular webinar. Certainly at Habitat, we're excited, uh, very excited to be uh, working with the EMG on this uh, inaugural uh, webinar. So I will go ahead and share my screen if I may. Can anyone see everyone see this well? Yes. OK, wonderful. I think 
most people in this webinar understand very well that when we talk about biodiversity, we're not just talking about uh, charismatic endangered species. As beguiling as many of them are, uh, biodiversity, of course, is a whole spectrum uh, from the genetic all the way to the scale of the ecosystem and biosphere. And it's really at that more complex scale of the ecosystem uh, where most of our work uh, and certainly what we'll be talking about today uh, is focused, uh, both because of the complexity of the issues, but also because of the impact that working at that scale can deliver. Uh, of course, ecosystems deliver ecosystem services. Uh, a lot of them, the benefits of what nature can deliver, particularly in cities, uh, are not well known. We did a survey uh, of 50 or so cities a few years ago to look at uh, those that had um, planned and implemented urban parks and other green spaces generally for recreation, for adaptation to climate effects. And we found that there was a whole host of benefits that nature was essentially delivering for free uh, that no one really knew about. It wasn't in the literature. It wasn't being measured or monitored. It wasn't even acknowledged, uh, amongst which really critical processes like pollination, carbon storage and nutrient recycling. And we were quite inspired by this because we thought if mayors and other decision makers at local scale understood better the co-benefits often hidden that nature was providing, there would be much more incentive to invest more heavily in future. Uh, the real problem though is that a lot of that nature, particularly at the edge of cities, is under threat. That same survey showed that land use change was in almost every region of the world the most significant threat uh, to the environment. Uh, a lot of land use change happens in the first place for agricultural purposes, but this, as we found, uh, paves the way for a very immediate second transition uh, to human uses, cities, uh, infrastructure development. And that's really critical because once we have built infrastructure in places, uh, there is a great degree of permanence uh, fixity, as we sometimes call it, that's very difficult and expensive to change. So we know that densities in cities across the world are declining, which means sprawl is increasing. Uh, but it's not just a measure to say of, of the quantity. Uh, this isn't just about the overall amount of green space that we're preserving or is being lost. Uh, the complexity here with the ecosystems is really in the configuration. It's how all the pieces interact. And we see here at right one of the, it was a pioneering study done by the University of Stuttgart in the German state of Baden-Württemberg. And it was looking at fragmentation of the natural landscape. And we see here uh, relatively few large green patches and a lot of cutting up into pieces of the remaining landscape, uh, often by roads, not necessarily in urban areas, but between urban areas. And we began to understand ourselves much more that it's in that in-between space that we need to be working as well as within uh, urban areas. A uh, project called the Cities and Biodiversity Outlook uh, just over 10 years ago now uh, was the first global study of the relationship between cities and nature. And it produced a very alarming figure uh, which was of great help in our advocacy for the SDGs, uh, that 60% of the area expected to be urban by 2030 had not yet been built, which essentially meant more than a doubling in the built-up areas for humans, uh, more in those 18 years than had been built in the entire history of humanity. A study soon thereafter done by the University of Pennsylvania, which is now a formal partner of Habitat, uh, looked at the world's 36, uh, if I get that right, 36 biodiversity hotspots. Uh, it looked at all cities over 200,000 people and found that more than 90% of them were growing or expanding in direct conflict with biodiversity. Unfortunately, the prevailing, I could say, accelerating paradigm for what that type of city looks like tends more and more to be either sprawling, as you see here on the left, or segregated, as you see on the right, or some of both, 
We're also seeing a lot more uh, informal development seen here on the left and highly speculative development as we see here on uh, the right. Uh, and this really points to the key question of what the quality of the cities we're building is and how that impacts upon nature. And we look at this, these high degrees of sprawl, of fragmentation and segregation, we're seeing uh, results that are not just bad for planet, but also for people. So it was, and Hossein mentioned this earlier, we were um, uh, very, I think, galvanized and gratified by the work uh, that the EMG has been doing to pull together uh, a very uh, unwieldy group of specialized UN agencies uh, so that we can understand how it is that we're all from the lenses of our particular disciplines addressing issues of biodiversity loss uh, came together with this common approach. Uh, I, I won't give any more summary, I think, than, than Hossein did, except to say that um, it, it, as UN agencies, we committed to 50 or so specific actions that we would undertake jointly. And I focus here only on two of those for the purposes of today. One, uh, very exciting uh, that the UN system has committed to improving the quality of urbanization and limiting encroachment. That was action 10. Uh, action 41 uh, is specifically on promoting integrated spatial planning. Um, there have been some very excellent tools out there for helping cities do this, amongst which the Singapore Index or the City Biodiversity Index uh, help cities measure and monitor where they're going, uh, including some issues of governance and of fragmentation. Our concern, uh, I think I'll keep going, um, was that there was not a lot out there helping cities um, prevent replicating bad outcomes. Um, a lot of the work of the EMG uh, and of the common approach uh, prompted us as an agency to look at where the gaps were in terms of normative guidance, in terms of pilot projects and action in the field. Uh, and so we did this brief study looking at, you see here on the y-axis, the types of actions that spatial planning can, can um, aim at for biodiversity from uh, preservation of intact green space all the way at the top to developing and creating new green space where it's been destroyed or it doesn't exist. Uh, here you see at the x-axis at different scales. And what we see, and you see this highlighted in red essentially, was that there was very little guidance or work happening around the issue of avoiding loss or of preventative planning uh, at the scale of the neighborhood and city, uh, which was to say, in a way, uh, as important as restoration of ecosystems is, it can't keep up with the pace of destruction. So we knew then that we urgently needed uh, to pull together more uh, to help cities make educated decisions, particularly at their edges, where they're changing about how and where to develop. Uh, in parallel, again, the University of Pennsylvania did an atlas, atlas for the end of the world, as it's quite soberingly called, uh, and it was overlaying uh, urban growth projections with uh, the the range of uh, threatened species, IUCN red list three and four, uh, and at the kind of center of this Venn diagram you see on the left, projecting where land use conflict zones might uh, happen. And on the right, you can see that for the metro area of Sao Paulo. Uh, in the nick of time, it was then that uh, the global biodiversity framework, now known as the biodiversity plan, uh, was adopted in 2022, Kunming, Montreal being the two hosts. Uh, and amongst many other things, including the headline or one of the headline goals of protecting 30% uh, of the Earth's land by 2030, aka 30 by 30, uh, we're quite excited about two uh, very novel uh, first ever targets uh, shown here. Number one, uh, which commits the parties, uh, the governments of the world to spatial planning. And 12, uh, which is specifically about green and blue spaces, quantity, quality, connectivity within cities. At the same time, uh, Habitat put out a white paper, uh, which really was trying to address that specific gap uh, around not enough guidance or good examples uh, for cities both uh, to, to 
preserve green space inside, but to uh, guide what's happening at the continuously evolving edge. Uh, and what we said is that cities have got to know more about how to project where they're growing, to predict where land use conflict might happen, uh, to prioritize where to grow with least harm and, and ultimately prevent replication of mistakes. Uh, so we're working on this methodology that projects all three uh, urban growth, biodiversity loss, climate risk uh, to 2050, overlays them uh, and essentially comes up with what we're calling a stoplight, hotspot stoplight. Uh, and we have uh, very happily Costa Rica on this call today. We'll talk more about what is happening in Costa Rica and in San Jose now. Uh, but this is just a quick view of the future. We're really working at high resolutions with with um, open source data to help cities predict uh, where uh, loss might most occur and how they can um, essentially make educated decisions uh, about, again, where and how uh, to develop with uh, minimal harm, both to planet and people. Um, ultimately leading to a series of decisions uh, at different scales from the city center to the far outlying edge about what's most appropriate where, whether it's preservation, restoration or creation. Uh, and our hope at the end of the day, and I'm sure we're going to see uh, some very inspiring examples soon, uh, is that cities can, uh, in their compact areas, pull more greening, more walkability, uh, more integration, so that at the edge, uh, they can still preserve uh, bits of nature, integrate agriculture, uh, and keep large green patches. With that, I say thanks and pass back to you, Paula. Thank you very much. You're muted, Paula. Oh, sorry. And thank you, Andrew. Uh, thank you so much for this. And I, I was saying that I'm very much, uh, I'm, I'm very happy that we met through this workshop because I'm going to involve you also in our work in the future as the, your presentation is, uh, is it was very key uh, to um, really stress a very important point. What you said, the restoration does not keep up with the level of destruction. And that's really the, the focus of what we are discussing today. How do we make sure that we find again that balance and how do we do it within cities and uh, or, or in peri-urban areas? And that's a, a, a very important challenge. And I'm happy that this is the focus of today's workshop. And uh, with this, we are going to move to the uh, esteemed speakers that we have that are going to tell us how they do, how they keep, keep up this, this pace. Um, let me introduce you to the panelists that represent governments and international organizations. Uh, apologies in advance if I don't pronounce the names correctly. Is Rodrigo Caimanque, representing the Santiago Green Infrastructure Plan for the city of Santiago in Chile. Rodrigo is an architect as a Master of Science in Spatial Planning and a PhD in Development Planning. He has a vast professional background in urban planning and urban projects at different scales, including an active academic development in urban planning, governance, strategic planning and urban regeneration. We then have Manuel Morales from the Ministry of Housing and Human Settlements of Costa Rica. So welcome also uh, Manuel, uh, Mr. Morales is an architect and doctor in education with more than 20 years of experience in public policies, urban planning and design, sustainable development, housing and human settlements, among other topics. He's the former director of housing and coordinator of the technical planning secretariat of the housing, habitat and territory sector of Costa Rica, and is currently an advisor to the ministerial office at the Ministry of Housing and Human Settlements. Last but not least, we have Mumo Muzuva from Nairobi Rivers Commission, who has kindly prepared a presentation on actions developed in Nairobi, Kenya, and lessons learned. Mr. Musuva serves as a commissioner within the Nairobi Rivers Commission and an independent government of Kenya commission in, uh, at re reclaiming Nairobi's rivers in alignment with the city blue and green infrastructure for enhanced urban living. His professional focus encompasses building design, urban regeneration, and sustainable development. 
So I would like now to give the floor to Rodrigo, who will present the case of Santiago Green Infrastructure Plan and how it is the incorporation actions for biodiversity conservation and preservation. Um, sorry, and how it is incorporating actions for biodiversity conservation and preservation. Thank you, Rodrigo, for your presence today, and I'll pass the floor on to you. Please go ahead. Okay, thank you, Paola. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, well, I'm going to share the screen. Uh, can everyone see this presentation? Yes. Can you see it? Great. Okay. I'm going to um, set the time just to to stick to the 15 minutes. Well, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to present our experience developing the green infrastructure infrastructure plan in Santiago. Well, my name is Rodrigo Gaimanque and I'm professor, assistant professor at the University of Chile and part uh, member of, of the part of the team that, that built this this plan called uh, Santiago Mas. Uh, so I'm going to show for, uh, first uh, some a uh, little a short background of Santiago. Uh, Santiago is well, it's the capital of Chile. It's a city of almost with almost eight million uh, inhabitants, and is a high dynamic uh, city in terms of uh, the, the economy and, uh, and well, the, the services uh, that, that happen uh, in, the, in the city. It also presents high levels of segregation and inequality. Um, Santiago has, has been described as a fragmented city uh, because uh, it is possible to observe very contrasting social conditions and urban structure in close proximity. Uh, normally, it's associated to uh, the contrast between low and high income, income neighbors uh, with, of course, very uh, different degrees of green infrastructure. Uh, but we also have, in addition, uh, spatial and jurisdictional fragmentation as the metropolitan area of Santiago uh, is a conurbation composed by 36 municipalities. Uh, with different administrative uh, local governments uh, with their own mayor, councils, and contra co contrasting budgets. Uh, as you can see in the map on the, on the right, uh, the, the blue areas are the richest part of the, of the, of the Metropolitan Santiago, the Metropolitan, Metropolitan Santiago uh, and the red one are, are the poorest area. And we'd we don't have a, a, a kind of leadership uh, of a city mayor. So we have serious issues of uh, coordinations uh, between uh, different uh, municipalities. And all this also affects the green infrastructure. Uh, Santiago has a important deficit of uh, public green areas, uh, a huge problem of distribution of these green areas. As you can see, the Particularly the the, the, the former the, the blue areas that I showed before uh, concentrates most of the uh, square meters per inhabitant, while the poorest area uh, barely reached the the one square meter per inhabitant. So we have this kind of inequalities in the in the metropolitan area of Santiago. Moreover, uh, we have uh, currently we have several initiatives uh, to protect and develop green infrastructure in Santiago by different public institutions, uh, such as the Ministry of, Ministry of Housing, uh, the Environmental uh, Ministry, the regional government, etc. The problem is they don't have uh, enough uh, coordination among them, which creates some uh, sectoral uh, policies that are not connected to each other. And also we have a uh, uh, these coordinations increased when we include uh, several uh, civil society organizations that also are working in different uh, plans and proposals to uh, uh, create this, this green, uh, a green Santiago, basically. So um, it, this um, uh, multi-dimensional fragmentations, uh, fragmentations, both uh, physically, also in terms of, of governance, 
provides key arguments for uh, the co-production co of a green uh, strategic uh, plan for Santiago. And that's how Santiago Mass uh, green uh, infrastructure uh, were, were born, basically as a process that started uh, between the University of Chile and the, and the Ministry of Housing, and then including at the beginning 20 members or partner, uh, partners, and which has, which has increased through the time. Uh, the plan was actually launched uh, in December uh, 2023 uh, with, with all the stakeholders in which we present the, the, the actual plan uh, that, that we made. And as you can see in the, in the website uh, that I show, sorry, and, uh, right here in the, in the right, uh, top right of the screen. Um, and we included uh, 30, uh, 32 institutions that were signed the, the compromise to, to use this uh, infrastructure plan as a, as a guidance for, uh, for future investment, investment in, the, in, the, in, the re, in the region. So in terms of uh, definition, uh, the, the green infrastructure plan is an indicative strategic planning uh, instrument built through collaboration between public, private, and civil society, civil society actors. It seeks to transform Santiago into a more sustainable and resilient city. Uh, among their goals, uh, the plan expects to consolidate and integrate, uh, consolidate an integrated network of green spaces, promote equity, uh, preserve and include nature in the city, and connect the city with the regional territory. In, in, in some ways, the, the plan seeks to uh, fill the gap between the different scales uh, in which the green is uh, materialized. Uh, we work with four concepts uh, interconnected, uh, in which the well, the system, the, the idea of the system is, is quite important in terms of functional and related green spaces, the diversity of the green spaces from diverse origins and characteristics, from the large scale plan in, infrastructure plan to the self managed uh, neighborhood uh, squares, for instance. Um, we hope to uh, well pr produce green spaces with multiple functions and the connectivity, both spatially and functionally, uh, link uh, green spaces. Uh, so uh, we started uh, for one year and a half uh, promoting, explaining the key concepts uh, such as green infrastructure, natural based, uh, so nature based solution, ecosystem system, and so on, in order to first promote the idea of, of the importance of the green infrastructure, create a common language, create trust and collaboration and engagement through several bilateral meetings, seminars, collective mappings, workshop, training session, and so on. So here you can see some images of, of the process we, we made uh, through all this, uh, throughout these years, uh, including the pandemics that uh, indeed uh, affect uh, the process of, uh, of the plan materialization. But we, we, we were able to, to finish, uh, hopefully, um, fortunately. <laughs> and well, here are some of the key players that work with us, uh, 20 uh, public services working with us, uh, 16 uh, members of the civil society, six university and research centers, and three members uh, of the private sector. And of course, we, we also work with them uh, stakeholder uh, stakeholder mappings in order to to understand the relations among this this these players uh, focus on the green infrastructure for Santiago and we can see here is the the core members that uh, well it's not surprised that the Ministry of Housing uh, and the environmental ministry as well and the regional governments uh, are the key players for, or, or the core uh, players in the in this network of, of collaborations we we create uh, through through the through the 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 plan Santiago Mas and well after lots of meetings and and process of uh, deliberation we and negotiations we agree on two goals uh, that balance the most relevant and social environmental issues uh, one is first uh, it's to contribute to the social and spatial integration of the city, the idea of uh, revert the fragmentations of Santiago, 
and also to help Santiago's uh, climate change adaption. Um, we also define a key uh, green infrastructure components of the network, uh, which include urban parks, forests, hills and rivers, and uh, urban streams and green corridors. Uh, although this, uh, this spatial structure has been agreed among all the stakeholders, um, there's still a, a concern uh, regarding the materialization of this project, especially when we talk about uh, corridors or other inter-municipal uh, green spaces. Uh, this appears as the, as the key challenges of the of the materialization of, of, the, of the of Santiago Mas because of this uh, pro this fragmentations both both institutional and, and physical that we have in the in the city. So this is a key challenge that we must be highlight. Um, the, then we create uh, sp uh, key strategies uh, that were uh, for the implementation of, of Santiago Mas. We, create, uh, we made 10 strategies and 37 actions to, uh, to implement the, the Santiago Mass plan. So these are, are the key components, basically to strengthen the knowledge of green infrastructure, uh, included in, in regulatory frameworks, uh, enhanced governance as well, uh, strengthen institution for the implementation of green infrastructure, participation, uh, rethink financial system for green spaces. This is a key component as well. Uh, innovative design standards, uh, improve the management of green infrastructure, how we deal with uh, and, and how we man maintain uh, the green infrastructure when it is, uh, is constructed or, or built, and also disseminate the implementation of Santiago Mas uh, to, the, to the rest of the, of the society, of, of the communities. We work, as, as, I, as I said, in different uh, scales. The plan works, uh, is structured by the, um, the ecological conditions of the region and uh, reaching also the, the micro scale in which the, the street, uh, gardens, squares are, so, are also pretty important. So we're working in a multi scalar perspective in order to, uh, to create different kinds of projects. Uh, those projects that are related to the, uh, the, the region ecosystem and also those that are important to uh, revert process of uh, the, the lack of, of public space or green public space, especially in poor areas of the of the city. So th these are some uh, little exa uh, small examples uh, pilots that we have developed in uh, framed uh, by the Santiago Mas uh, plan and some collaborations we made with the Ministry of Housing and the regional uh, government and some other collaborations with other universities, uh, partner universities, uh, such as Aguas de Barrio, working in the in this uh, uh, small public spaces or, or available uh, brown areas, uh, the, the project called Jardín Biodiverso with the Central University. So uh, we seek to find different kind of collaboration in order to uh, create pilots that helps to materialize uh, a wider uh, plan. So governance is also uh, a key component of the plan. How we are going to lead uh, the plan, who is going to lead actually the plan uh, institutionally. Uh, we need the political support for the implementation of the plan. We need the, this kind of leadership of different institutional actors with capacity to influence the development and plan and, and the management of the plan, uh, we promote the, the uh, proposed sorry the, the executive uh, the creation of an executive committee bringing together public and private institutions as well and the civil society, uh, create forms of uh, leading and disseminate the implementation of the plan and technical roundtables to advance processes and initiatives. So. Well, linked with the with the stakeholder mapping we made, uh, indeed, is the regional government, the Ministry of Housing, and the Environmental uh, Ministry of perhaps the key players uh, that might uh, lead uh, Santiago Mas with with the support, of course, of the University of Chile and and, and the the rest of the actors and players working in the co-production of the plan. 
So to finish, uh, if you give me just one extra minute, uh, the lesson uh, we learned, yeah. First, uh, we realized there is a huge consensus on the importance of green infrastructure. So there's a, an important willingness to collaborate from from public to private sectors and civil society and the, and the academy. And that works throughout the, the entire process of the uh, elaboration of the plan. So participation is a key component of the plan, both uh, from the diagnosis to the elaboration. It's not only to, to get information, but also how to build the plan itself. Um, the integration of public, private, and academic resources provide a cohesive, cohesive environment indeed. And, uh, and also this uh, multiscalar approach uh, becomes relevant for integrate uh, green initiatives from, well, from large natural areas to neighborhood levels, which also increase the interest among different uh, actors uh, because they have their, their different uh, uh, scope regarding the, the, their interest. Uh, the ministerial commitment were very important for obtaining, um, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, for obtaining institutional and political support of the plan. And we see also the, the importance of the regional government, which appear uh, that appears as a key institution, a new democratic institution anchored in the territory and a potential articulator of scale. However, it's currently readjusting its institutional structures and plans. So how we fit uh, the, uh, the Santiago Mas with the, this uh, governance adjustment uh, of the regional governments, it, it's a, an interesting uh, challenge. So this is the last uh, slide and I finished. Uh, in the Chilean system, uh, an entity must, well, we need an entity that has to adopt and incorporate the plan into the institutional frameworks. So we have to, how, how the plan can uh, actually fit in the, in the, in this, sectoral forms of, of governing in the in the city. Um, establishing articulation between Santiago mass governance and existing institution while integrating with other stakeholders. We we had a, a huge uh, uh, participation of different stakeholders, but once the plan became uh, becomes institutionalized, how these stakeholders are, are going to continue participating. This is a challenge, an important challenge. So also, how we can how can we effectively integrate green initiatives across multiple scales? How how can we ensure sustained investment is is an important task. How we incorporate uh, municipal interest in green infrastructure is also important. There's a uh, many uh, municipalities that are, are trying to include uh, green infrastructure in their uh, master plans. And this is this leads uh, leads us to uh, the final challenge, which how the green infrastructure comes as a concept can be included in urban and regional planning system, which according uh, is is more like a uh, the normative instrument. How we how we uh, fit uh, and and include the green infrastructure into this instrument it remains as a key challenge in order to secure. The, the importance of this uh, this concept and this this kind of initiatives. So I finish with this. Um, thank you very much, and I'm sorry that I my extensions in minutes that I extend some extra minutes. Thank you, Rodrigo. Thank you, Rodrigo. And I did not stop you because it was indeed very very interesting. So I wanted to hear the whole story, and I'm actually uh, fascinated. And I, I, I think you highlighted a few crucial points also that biodiversity is not for the sake of biodiversity only, but it's for the people. And while you're looking at connectivity and accessibility is really for the people living in the city. So it's really, uh, you're really looking at uh, two objectives and goals here. And also thank you for stressing the role of private sector and all this multiple, it looks complicated of course, because you have many stakeholders, but that's when it's successful, when everybody's involved and and, and doing their part. So very much interesting. Um, really, I wish I, we had more time to listen to these uh, cases. We don't, but maybe we can hear a bit more from you with the questions. I'm pretty sure that people will have questions to ask. So uh, I'm going to move on now. And I would like to invite uh, uh, Mr. Manuel Morales from the Ministry of Housing and Human Settlements of Costa Rica to take the floor and share the experience and knowledge from actions being implemented in San Jose. Uh, Manuel, uh, lo looking forward to hearing from you. The floor is yours. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Um, good morning from the Western Hemisphere and good, good afternoon to you who are in the Eastern Hemisphere. It is a real pleasure and an honor for me to be able to share a, a few words with you in this event. And I want to thank again UN Habitat, the Environmental Management Group, and the organizers um, on behalf of the Office of Ms. Angela Mata, Minister of Housing and Human Settlements of Costa Rica, uh, who sends her, uh, her greetings and appreciations also for your kind invitation. Um, for her and for us at the Minister, uh, th uh, these issues, these topics are uh, one of the biggest priorities in, in this administration. Um, I'm going to ask you please to uh, to forward uh, to the next slide. Thank you very much. In contradiction with its many achievements in response to climate change and biodiversity conservation, Costa Rica cities are not emblems of sustainability, efficiency and livability. Stagnant poverty rates and rising inequalities manifest in the country's urban area, areas and centers where Pockets of poverty persist in some of the most economically dynamic and affluent parts of the country. The greater metropolitan area of Costa Rica, which we call GAM, is the clearest reflection of the urban crisis we are experiencing. This region concentrates Costa Rica's economic activity and more than half of its population. The land area comprising the GAM tripled between 1979 and today, and its peripheral development is marked by waves of informal land occupation. Despite leading the region in terms of GDP, access to employment, and human development indices, the GAM exhibits significant territorial inequalities, as well as other challenges derived from its accelerated growth and unplanned urban expansion. Next slide, please. As most uh, Latin American countries, Costa Rica urbanized very rapidly and the growth of its cities took place largely unplanned. The metropolitan area surrounding San Jose, the capital city, which concentrates half of the country's population and almost 75% of national production, emerged as a cluster of rural towns and small cities. Many households settled in disaster prone areas exposing them to hazards and making them more vulnerable to the effect of climate change. Metropolitan areas, urban regulations, have contributed for a long time to foster and maintaining low structural densities. The older urbanized central locations are declining in population as they have exhausted their reserves of developable land, precluding them from accommodating new growth. The peripheral areas, which are more accessible and available for development, are experiencing an increase in population. New residential areas grow fast and are often unplanned, creating monofunctional areas, increasing the demand for basic services and causing road congestion. Um, we, we can find uh, many similarities to the case just presented by the Chilean colleague. Um, next slide, please. Among other challenges, we face the need to strengthen the capacities of municipalities to plan and regulate land use, the need to improve housing conditions, particularly amongst low-income families, and to address the complex challenges facing informal settlements, using land wisely and increasing options for public mass transport and active mobility, alongside targeted investments to improve housing and informal settlements and invest in regeneration of 15-minute cities. Next slide, please. The housing deficit in Costa Rica is of 10.2% of the total homes in the country. There are today a, a, almost 600 informal settlements we have formally identified at the minister, at the ministry, uh, of which 53% are located in the central region of the country, most of which deal with significant disaster risk condition, conditions and, 
attempt against nature and water conservation. Regulatory plans as local urban planning instruments are essential for the definition of objectives and strategies for the improvement of informal settlements, as well as other issues. However, there is a significant delay in its formulation, adoption, and implementation. Half the municipalities in the country do not have regulatory or territorial planning as of today. And in most cases, the regulatory plans are still unable to make a particular reading of the informal settlements and link them to their strategic development, land use, and nature conservation and preservation views. Next slide, please. To face these and other challenges, we have been working on priority programs and strategies, such as strategies for expansion and diversification of housing modalities and typologies, urban renewal strategies, regularization and relocation of informal and irregular settlements, land access strategies and management of the state land portfolio for housing projects, preventive risk management strategies and emergency response in housing and human settlements, financing strategies and instruments for housing programs and comprehensive neighborhood improvement. Next slide, please. In this framework, we're also working on an approach that focuses on integrating issues such as the right to the city, the right to landscape and, and a healthy environment and social urban social. The right to the city advocates for equitable urban development where planning, regulation, and urban environmental management guarantee, among other aspects, the social function of the city, prioritize the social production of habitat, and, the prog and that the programs and project sectors integrate the issue of urban security as an attribute of, of public space. Landscape, in its comprehensive vision, participates in the general objective of achieving sustainability and it is intrinsically linked to climate change. It does not recognize borders and is a complex integrative process between neighboring territories, thus its importance. <clears throat> the political constitution of Costa Rica establishes that every person has a right to a healthy and ecologically balanced environment. We cannot understand this right unrelated to adequate territorial and urban development, including access to housing in suitable habitats. Hence, the importance of increasingly articulating the efforts made by different strategic sectors of national and subnational scale of governance and development, and learning to measure and evaluate the incidents and impacts that the actions of some sectors have on the others. For example, there's an indicator that reflects this aspect very well. This is the World Health Organization indicator that says that for every dollar invested in access to clean drinking water and environmental sanitation infrastructure, a country's public health <coughs> system can save up to $4.6. And we can also make these types of extrapolations in relation, for example, to the high cost of vehicular chaos in, in the greater metropolitan area due to the unsustainable sustainable patterns and trends of expansive growth of the urban area. We're talking, according to estimates, of more than 3.5% of the country's GDP. Also, the process of stitching the urban fabric is a long-term process in which various factors related to urban systems are involved. And it is from that point where the urban fabric begins to be reestablished with strategies to integrate those fragmented territories. All this while institutions and communities understand that it is not feasible to address human development and natural conservation as isolated and unlinked efforts. Next slide, please. In 2023, we were co proponents alongside Colombia and other partners in the formulation of the Biodiverse and Resilient Cities Resolution for mainstreaming biodiversity and ecosystem services into urban and territorial planning. The initiatives and measures aimed at reducing the vulnerability of natural and human systems to the real or expected effects of climate change suggest that the different nature-based solution approaches can be used in combination with other types of interventions and help in this way generate multiple benefits for populations, biodiversity, and at the same time, strengthen resilience of the cities. 
This model resolution seeks to transform cities in the short, medium, and long term by mainstreaming biodiversity in urban planning and promoting the sustainable use and protection of biodiversity and ecosystems. This is based on the idea that urban areas are not only centers of economic and social development, but also important spaces for biodiversity and for promoting processes of ecological connectivity between urban and rural areas. These actions should be prioritized and adopt, adapted according to conditions and needs of each city and should be implemented in a coordinated and participatory manner with the support of different stakeholders, such as the public and private sex sectors, multilateral agencies, academia, civil society, organizations, and citizens in general. Likewise, it is essential to contemplate the systemic integration of various components of the urban landscapes, such as the various land uses and their connections, various subsystems, ecological, productive, economic, social, institutional, among others, the diversity of services per subsystem, the functionality of the total system, including factors of balance between health and deterioration, the integration of the dimensions of the system also implies an adequate scaling of it and the subsystem at the operational, social, cultural, institutional, and ecological level. This, in turn, taking into account the particularities of the management process and appropriate governance strategies. Next slide, please. In this context, I would like to comment also on the National Urban Environment Agenda which within the framework of, the, of this and other efforts we are about to resume between the Housing and Human Settlement Sector and the Ministry of Environment and Energy of Costa Rica. The objective of this is to specify a work plan that promotes synergies for the creation of healthy, resilient, accessible, and sustainable cities and human settlements, which maximize ecosystem services, promoting harmonious and sustainable development between biodiversity and gray, green, and blue infrastructure, in urban spaces, ensuring human well-being and the conservation of species. The agenda contemplates a prioritization of strategic intervention interventions negotiated between both ministries distributed across four axes, sustainable mobility and infrastructure, resilient urban territories that promote biodiversity, technological innovation and research, governance and financing. These types of agendas are seen as an opportunity to operationalize the implementation of joint intersectoral strategies to address complex social territorial problems that require decisive political institutional articulation. An example of this is the neighborhood improvement strategy, which we are about to make official in the coming months as a public policy instrument that allows us to better coordinate with municipalities in the management of informal, irregular settlements in conditions and also settlements in conditions of, of high non mitigable risk. The strategy constitutes an instrument that will help implement Axis 4 of the national policy of habitat, as well as integrating a series of inputs and mechanisms that will help prioritize and focus the different approaches required to, her, to care or informal and irregular settlements from the perspective of five strategic scenarios. One, resettlement or relocation. Two, regularization. Three, on-site renovation. Four, formalization. Five, big scenario approach. On a future occasion, we would love to tell you more about this and other initiatives we have underway. Next slide, please. For some final thought, the country, as uh, is generally the case in Latin American region, faces urgent challenges in terms of updating and aligning regulatory and public policy instruments on territorial planning, urban planning, housing, and conservation. This implies the need to strengthen coordination mechanisms with local government whose participation and commitment in the design and development of responses to environmental risks urban informality and access to land are essential. The state must ensure that housing solutions also constitute as well urban development solutions. One cannot speak of adequate housing without adequate habitats in a healthy environment. 
and there can be no adequate habitat without equitable and sustainable urban development. Next slide, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manuel. Thank you. Uh, it was very interesting to listen to your presentation of regenerative urban planning. That's a, a, an interesting aspect. And also, I think what came up again, and it was uh, highlighted also before with Santiago, is that nature conservation is still not part of the practice of urban planning. And this is something that uh, should happen. And maybe we can discuss about this later. But certainly, even, even at the, the level of architectural school, this is something that dealt with separately from the pure exercise of urban planning, while it should be one. And I think this is the, it's probably one of the main problems, is, is not the main problem of why uh, nature conservation is, is not, uh, is not uh, fully taken into account in the planning process. Um, we are getting to the last speaker, last but not least. Um, to finalize really this wonderful panel, let me pass the floor on to Mr. Mumo Musuva, who will share the experience and lessons learned from the uh, example of Nairobi in Kenya. After uh, his presentation, of course, we will then have time, of course, for exchanges and questions. Uh, Mr. Musuva, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. I, I'm not sure if you can hear me. Am I audible? Yes. Yes. Very good. OK, super. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if 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 you if you hear little voices, it's because I'm working from home. So forgive me. I've tried to lock the door tight, but uh, <laughs> just in case you hear that, you'll know where. Um, so I, I must say this. This has been a very interesting session listening to uh, the various uh, discussions on play. I, I, I probably would would say that uh, in Nairobi, we are probably about three, four steps behind uh, the other case studies that have been shown. Uh, and that is because uh, we're, we're, we're just beginning to uh, come to terms uh, with uh, the whole concept and thinking around um, uh, how to implement a major regeneration project for the rivers and 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 to to do it in a more uh, sustainable and structured way. Um, we have had uh, many uh, interventions in the past, but most of them have been largely focused on uh, cleaning the rivers rather than um, uh, um, uh, rather than having a meaningful uh, and 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 more direct. Uh, and sustained program and approach to to regeneration. So I hope through this presentation, which I will do in three parts, uh, I can be able to share with you um, the direction with which we, um, as the Nairobi Rivers Commission, uh, have been advocating for uh, the rivers regeneration, and just to show how that ties in uh, very strongly with the theme of the uh, webinar today, which is looking at how urban spatial planning for biodiversity preservation works, because for us that is at the heart of everything. So um, uh, I think where where should I start? I think the the one of the key challenges that we've had uh, in our part of the world is is understanding um, uh, the asset or the natural asset that we're dealing with. I mean, most of the interventions and approaches have been uh, either reactionary or um, visionary. Visionary in the sense that there's always an appreciation and understanding of what is good and what people want to see as good, but translating that from uh, challenge to action and implementation has always been a problem. Now, when you think about uh, the challenges of uh, emerging cities like Nairobi, uh, where you have um, very many socioeconomic uh, uh, competing interests and 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 many areas that are competing for very limited resources. You always find that um, uh, the things that are complex and difficult will always be put to the back because people just don't understand how to implement them, and people focus on the more straightforward uh, investment types that they can feel and touch. So our our approach as a commission and to try and change that trajectory 
um, has been to refocus the conversation on the rivers, not just as an important part of our environment and, and an important part of uh, ecology and biodiversity, but more so as an asset. And I, I think the thinking here has been that if we can be able to change the conversation uh, around the rivers and, and looking at them as a natural asset that is of great socioeconomic value uh, and that ties into social, cultural, economic, uh, talk about climate resilience, adaptability, and, and, and various investment goals, then we can be able to put ecology and biodiversity restoration, food and water security at the heart of the conversation in a more meaningful way and be able to get both public sector and private sector looking at this uh, in, in a, as, as serious opportunities for, for investment and, 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 um, and, and um, and, and participation. So our work as a commission um, uh, formed is to try and tie in that integrated approach between socioeconomic, ecology and biodiversity and to see how that um, uh, uh, furthers the conversation. So for us, um, the Nairobi rivers, um, uh, uh, we're, we're part of a much wider river basin. In fact, Nairobi sits on the upper catchment uh, section of of what is known as the Athi River Basin. Uh, and um, the entire basin is projected to have an ecosystem uh, worth of about $2.3 billion. And, and the cost of pollution is estimated at about $225 million. We think that's grossly underestimated. We think that um, there's definitely a much higher impact uh, on, on pollution. And, and we think that the, 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 the ecosystem services um, are, are also undervalued because there's a lot more that we are now learning uh, that we can be able to derive from our natural assets. And especially now that we're talking about the whole aspects of climate adaptation and climate resilience, uh, being able to bring the conversation around um, uh, understanding the value and the economics of, of that is very important. But you know, the story doesn't end there. It probably starts there because the, the in the case of Nairobi uh, being in the upper catchment and 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 uh, in an urban area, um, the pollution that's coming through the rivers, the destruction to biodiversity due to that pollution, uh, it, it, it is it is far more impactful. In fact, that diagram that you've got there shows the image of the river basin and where Nairobi sits, and by the time it gets probably uh, to about a third of the basin area. You have 60% of the uh, water volume being generated through that basin coming from that upper catchment area. And I think there's an estimate that says almost close to half of that water is contaminated by pollution. And 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 you, you can't just begin to imagine uh, what what the impact of that is. So so in our case, um, we are advocating very strongly that uh, there's an economic case um, for for regeneration. Um, we are, we're linking this to economic development because uh, as a developing country, um, a lot of interest is in facilitating um, uh, investment and economic growth and development. And we want the rivers to be at the heart of that conversation. Um, so we're looking at the water source, we're looking at the land source and looking at the potential for uh, exploitation of, of riverfront or river corridors. Uh, we're looking at waste, um, the, the amount of waste that's being generated uh, in the cities, uh, and we think a huge amount of that is finding its way to the rivers uh, because the, the, the statistics that we have on, on waste being collected through uh, the formal and semi-formal system only accounts for about 40% of the waste um, that, 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 that is produced. So the rest, we, we, we have a suspicion that that's getting into the rivers. And... Um, of course, with that, you have the ecosystem services. So um, at the heart of our, our story is, is Nairobi's growth trajectory, um, looking at population growth, uh, probably more than doubling uh, close to 2050, and looking at um, the water and the natural assets being a very, very important aspect of sustaining uh, population growth. And developing on the back of that strong imperatives for, for, for regeneration. So these become the key anchors of our uh, uh, approach and strategy 
towards regeneration and 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 what opportunities uh, we are hoping to be able to to extract from that um climate change um uh, I, again this this is a very interesting topic for us uh, especially uh, as we talk about climate adaptation i don't think resilience uh, is or or um um change to address issues related to climate change is the way we should be discussing in, in our part of the world. I think adaptation is the conversation we should be talking about because um, uh, we, we probably uh, contribute the least to the whole global equation of, um, uh, of, of greenhouse gases and emissions, and yet we are suffering the most in this part of the world. So we are focusing our conversation on adaptation. Uh, we want to put uh, wetlands, uh, rivers, and terrestrial body uh, and and um, uh, natural um, wetland areas as an important part of this economic conversation to see how we can be able to uh, enhance and capture the value that they contribute in terms of sequestering and and uh, also mitigating uh, risks like flood. Um, I don't know if you've all seen. Uh, pictures coming out of Nairobi right now. We're going through a major flood episode, and everybody is now sitting up and paying attention to uh, the impact of destroying wetlands and 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 um, um, poor urban planning that is resulting in poor drainage and the like. So we want to put that at the heart of of that conversation. And even as we do that, uh, we want to also. Uh, find ways of creating opportunities for investment. So, uh, as I mentioned, uh, land uses that are compatible with uh, uh, with riverfront, protecting uh, the river corridors. Um, we've just managed to convince uh, the government to uh, adopt a 60 to 45 meter uh, river planning corridor, which means that we 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 are encouraging review of land uses along the river corridors within uh, a range of 45 to 60 meters from the high water mark to allow for replanning and re-engineering of those areas to protect the rivers. Um, we are promoting very strongly um, the aspect of both natural and constructed urban wetland park systems and nature-based solutions uh, as a part of um, uh, cleaning and restoring uh, the systems, but also as a way of uh, creating green corridor spaces uh, along the river corridors and also utilizing areas where we think we can create urban water reservoirs um, uh, that are in, in line with, with, with the river corridors. And, and of course, adding to that waste to energy and urban agriculture. Um, Non-motorized transportation, um, that is a huge opportunity for Nairobi. We barely exploit that. We're just now beginning to discuss that and have conversations around that. And so we, we're also actively promoting um, the, the creation of non-motorized uh, networks uh, through these uh, constructed wetland park systems and using the river corridors uh, and, and, you know, with a forward thinking of how these can be interlinked uh, through various mass transportation systems. So for us, um, if we are able to get the conversation here, government policy uh, at this level, it'll then make it um, uh, uh, easier to design and develop bankable projects and, and look at innovate, innovative ways of resource mobilization so that we can be able to get the right level of investment and also looking at how we can be able to catalyze um, uh, private sector uh, investment opportunities uh, so that we can be able to drive that. And, and we know that these models have been used in other parts of the world, and, and we think that uh, Nairobi and Kenya are quite ready for that. So um, as we move forward, um, we've also uh, uh, convinced the city that um, we need to anchor a lot of this forward thinking uh, into a vision statement document. So the city right now is uh, has just started a conversation around uh, developing a Nairobi Vision 2050 and uh, the Nairobi rivers and the whole aspect of water habitat and biodiversity is going to be written into that um, uh, vision statement so that we can be able to um, uh, ensure we anchor investment in that. So um, I think Probably, uh, if you allow me just one minute, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about um, the approach in terms of catalytic um, uh, projects, and I'll just project something as I um, 
uh, as I uh, as I speak yeah. to that. Yeah, I know I have probably minutes. got a minute. I think I have a minute if I'm not wrong. Yes, yes. Well, I can give you up to three minutes, but no more because we need to have questions after. So please. OK, all right. So I guess you can see the video there. So um, I, can you see the video? Is that visible? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Yeah, so that's that's in terms of our thinking, in terms of um, uh, how we redefine these 45 to 60 meter corridors. So at the heart of it is is encouraging uh, creation of these constructed wetland park systems, uh, looking at resettling uh, people, particularly those in the informal settlements, back through the corridors, looking at some elements of um, engineering to um, uh, contain water for flooding, uh, but integrating that with uh, um, um, uh, nature-based solutions that would would um, improve the urban space along the rivers, but also linking that to um, economic activity. So um, in addition to housing, looking at markets, looking at public spaces that get intertwined in that. Now, this is a very bold, bold move on our part because um, we, we, we're saying that um, we must change the way we use um, our river corridors. We must be very deliberate about how uh, we use the riparian land, whether it's sitting on public land or, or private land. We, we've got to start defining that use rather than uh, letting people do whatever they want. And, and, and with that, show them what they can have um, and, and be able to develop that. And I'm very happy to tell you that uh, uh, this thinking has been adopted by government and it's now being dubbed as the Nairobi Green Corridors project as, as one of the main catalytic projects of, of driving the, the, the river's regeneration and inter, intertwining that with uh, ecology and biodiversity restoration. And so I'd like to stop there. Uh, very happy to uh, uh, take part in the questions and I'm very grateful for you inviting me to participate in this webinar. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Momo. It's very interesting and this 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 video is really beautiful and shows actually you're talking about creating value, but we should also say that biodiversity in an urban context also increases the value of the buildings themselves, of the real estate. So there is a double right value created right here and when you see this beautiful video you, you can understand why because people would like to live in a place like the one you are showing in Correct. such a close contact with nature so thank you for that yeah. uh, i'm pretty sure that uh, we will have an interest in asking you questions not only you uh, but all the three speakers so uh, we have more or less 10 to 15 minutes for questions and uh, i'm going to uh, open the floor for questions. I don't know whether I will see hands raised and who will raise the hand. So I suggest if someone has a question, just comes forward with the question and takes the floor. Um, I see that we have at the moment over 40 people connected. And uh, please, if there are any questions. Yes, we have Carla. Carla, please go ahead. Um, thank you so much, and thank you so much for those really interesting examples. Um, my name is Carla Kraft. I'm um, a policy specialist of sustainable development at UN Women, and I'm just um, wondering um, how how can we greater, you know, think more about integrating aspects of gender equality into urban planning and the linkages with, with biodiversity conservation. Um, it's more and more we're thinking about it, um, for example, in the context of um, creating urban plans that have uh, care centers closer to um, you know areas of 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 inequality and 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 decreased resources and increasing access to social services that sometimes women um, don't don't always have access to. So I'm just wondering if if anyone has been doing some thinking or there's some examples. I would love to to learn from you all and thank you very much for this very interesting webinar and and the space to engage. Thank you, Carla. Anybody wants to answer this question? Yeah, Mumu, you want to go ahead, please? 
Yeah, thank you very much. Actually, uh, quite interesting you asked that, and uh, because of time, I skipped that um, in 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 my presentation. Uh, you're quite right. I mean, we've 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 got to think about how we get uh, communities uh, involved, and and I think with that also to be able to uh, look at issues of, of gender equality in urban planning space. Now, what we are doing in Nairobi, um, and I don't know how useful this is in, in, in the general debate, is um, we actually have worked with communities as part of the thinking of that concept image that I presented. And, and what we did is uh, we put together communities along the river corridors, and we were able to divide the river corridor into zones, about five kilometer zones each. So we're able to sort of um, uh, plan uh, programs, projects and interventions in, in corridor spaces. And, and what we have done with the communities is, uh, and this is actually driven by, by them, is we've developed these River Connect kiosks or Climate Action Hub kiosks, which become uh, focal points for community engagement. And each one of these uh, to be placed at different locations within the sectors. And, and, and they become uh, not just a source of information, they also become a source of advocacy, they become a source of, um, uh, of, of, of getting community involvement in, in not just the thinking, but also the implementation. And, 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 and they just become a point of, of, um, of uh, uh, um, improvement and advocacy within that and and this has actually come out of of the communities because we found that even as we're thinking broadly about uh, these options and ideas of creating value for investment communities are actually doing it it's just the scale and and um, uh, the 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 ability for them to have somebody who can work with them to show them how they can actually achieve much more than what they think so this has been one of the solutions that we're actually very proud of uh, within the planning and the thinking of that, and it's being driven by the community. So through these centers, we're able to advocate and be able to um, uh, design into them uh, uh, women groups, community groups, youth, uh, and the like in, in as part of this uh, program. Thank you. I hope that 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 um, speaks to that question, at least from Nairobi's perspective. Thank you. Thank you, Mumo, and I'll uh, give it to Manuel now. Um, I guess you want to add something to this. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Um, in Costa Rica, as well as the rest of Latin American region, um, urban and rural poverty um, has a pace of, of women. It affects mostly uh, women. Uh, so uh, I want to um, to highlight the importance of a uh, planning and design of uh, more caring cities uh, with a uh, real and effective participatory processes where the participation of women uh, is not only uh, highlighted in the planning and design uh, models, but also in the governance uh, implementation models. Um, cities have been planned in our countries um, designed by men mostly with a very unequal approach and uh, so uh, this uh, inversion of uh, this uh, logic of planning and design is one of the, the the biggest issues we have been facing in the last years we still have a long way to go uh, in order to be able to implement that effectively uh, and well uh, we have to recognize that there's a direct correlation between uh, nature and community care and gender sensitive approach in, in these matters. Thank you. Thank you, Manuel. And uh, let me see, I don't see any more hands raised. So let me just add, Carla, in case you're interested, uh, EC is organizing every year a forum of mayors, and we have uh, done a special event for women mayors where we are discussing some of these issues. So maybe we can get in touch separately. Um, to discuss also if, if you're interested in participating in such uh, uh, an event. Uh, as I don't see any more uh, There's requests. There's a hand up the from Jamal. There's somebody ah, called Jamal. Thank you. Yeah. I don't see it. Yeah, then Jamal, please go ahead. Interesting, I don't see it. Thank yep. you. Thanks, yep. Paula. So, and please thank, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Thank you, everyone, the AMG Secretariat and the UN Habitat colleagues. 
and especially the representative of the countries for such an interesting cases. Uh, well, first of all, it's a very timely discussion. Uh, I represent the CBD Secretariat, Secretariat of the Convention on Biological Diversity. And as you have already mentioned, uh, the target one and the target 12 of the global biodiversity framework, those are the two targets where if we look at the indicators, we're still lacking a bit of the clarity of the methodology uh, on um, how the special planning could actually contribute to the biodiversity. So what does it mean, the biodiversity inclusive spatial planning? We heard three very interesting cases from the different countries. So the countries where the seed is already old and the country where the seed is still growing. So that's also in, um, a bit of um, um, adding different contexts, but really uh, what I would like to hear, and especially from the representative from academia, university, uh, whether you were thinking of how to measure actually the impact of green infrastructure to biodiversity, because that's where there is a gap and the research need which was identified um, by the expert group for the monitoring. And this is something what we will be discussing in a few weeks in Nairobi at the subsidiary uh, subsidiary body meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Jamal. Uh, anybody that wants to answer to Jamal on the, this issue of indicators and monitoring the impact? No answer to Jamal? Yeah, Rodrigo, well, you want to give it a try? Please, go ahead. Yeah, well, the, the thing is, uh, we're actually building indicators uh, with the regional government in the alliance with them, especially to to uh, to measure the, 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 the actual impact of, of green infrastructure uh, connected to the, the city of Santiago, of course. Uh, uh we can see how the, the the impact of green infrastructure from many perspectives I, I think one is the 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 equity of the of the green areas in the in a quite an equal uh city but also the 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 idea of a system of of green of the green in the whole city that 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 helps to uh rebuild the the, the 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 city ecosystem that many times are actually cut it by the, the the process of urbanization so how we rebuild this connection in terms of the uh, vegetation uh, vegetations and, and the, uh, the flora and the fauna uh, of, of of the city so uh we, we don't have i don't have the the, the figures now but uh we expect to, to to measure into into that uh uh, perspectives as well as the uh, the the square meters uh, of green areas in in in, uh, in the whole city, well distributed green areas as well. But yeah, I don't know if I am answering uh, rightfully the the question, but I think it's going into that direction, and we hope to to have this indicator for 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 the future and share it with you. Thank you so much, Rodrigo and Mumo. Over to you. Yeah, I think this is actually a very important question. Um, I I must confess, um, Jamal, I'm not very familiar with the targets per se, but um, I will speak from my own uh, experiences with uh, you know close to twenty years of advocacy on on regeneration and restoration of the rivers in Kenya. Um, I I feel that um, unless we're able to show tangible value that 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 can be quantified not just qualified um we will always struggle to to put um biodiversity restoration uh, as an important topic for a lot of communities in our part of the world because as i said uh, the, the competing interest is economic development uh, if i use that in, in in words and and everybody is rushing through um thinking that whatever they're doing uh, only makes sense if it counts for economic growth um uh, and not 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 appreciating that there are many other soft issues that that are equally important so i think if if the conversations and the discussions can 
move in the direction of um, uh, developing matrices or parameters of actually measuring and quantifying that value in, in tangible terms, then you will see a lot of proactive uh, investment and activity in, in regeneration uh, and, and with a focus on biodiversity restoration. Um, and, and until we get to that, um, we will struggle to see meaningful change on the ground without uh, being able to develop matrices that quantify that. So I'm, I don't think I'm offering an answer, but I'm just probably echoing why I think it's very important to uh, quantify that and make it in a manner that people understand and they can see value in, in investing time and energy in achieving that. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, to both of you. Jamal, I don't know if you want to add anything uh, at this point. No, thanks. Thank you. I think that was good answers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, at this point, I really don't see any uh, hand raised anymore, but maybe it's just me. I would say that in any case, as we have a time to respect, uh, we should uh, approach the closing of this uh, webinar. Um, I'm, I'm sorry that I wasn't very strict with keeping the time, but I have to say that the presentations were extremely interesting and, and then overall it's 4.33, so we haven't really gone beyond uh, too much uh, what we were, were, the time allocated. So, uh, well, let me just thank all the panelists for their time and insights and thanking all of you as well, the participants for uh, the attention and the engagement. We are, we're definitely inspired by the presentations and actually we look forward to keeping exchanging and learning on how to integrate uh, biodiversity in our agendas and daily work and highlighting the importance of the UN common approach to biodiversity. And of course, with the objective of providing a better support to our members and contributing to the GBF global goals and targets. Uh, we invite you to stay tuned, of course, and follow the upcoming webinars. I should remind you this was the first one of a series, so more to come. Um, and of course, also the activities of the MG Issue Management Group on Biodiversity. Uh, the last words uh, are left with Ms. Yannicka Pitkanen, Program Management Officer at the UN EMG Secretary. She will be closing this workshop. So I'm already saying goodbye to you and thank you all. Uh, thank you, Yannicka, now for your conclusions and uh, see you next time. Thank you. Over to you, Yannicka. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paola. And I'll try to be really brief, given that we have we have reached the end of our time today. The purpose of today's webinar has been to <clears throat> offer an opportunity to learn uh, from experience and exchange uh, of different best practices and lessons learned uh, in the implementation of spatial planning solutions that uh, support the conservation and protection of biodiversity with uh, illustrative examples from three different cities and, and sub-regions. And uh, on behalf of the EMG Secretariat, I would really like to warmly thank our experts connected from Nairobi, Santiago and San Jose uh, for their really insightful and inspiring presentations. Mm -hmm. It really gives us hope to learn about these positive developments and, and the persistent efforts that you do to take biodiversity into consideration and also linking biodiversity conservation to other development goals at the local level that touch people's lives, uh, perhaps in a more notable way than the global global collaboration and the negotiations that happen at the global level. And uh, I think that the presentations that we've heard today uh, show us really clearly that the challenges at the local level also reflect the similar challenges that we face at the global level when it comes to fragmentation and, and difficulties in coordinating. And um, also the intrinsic link among the sustainable development goals uh, have been clearly shown and that this requires addressing these challenges through different intersectoral strategies. And we have also seen that there is an economic case to preserve nature. I'd like to <clears throat> thank you, Andrew, for setting the scene in such an eye opening way and also for linking this work to the context contextual framework uh, that the UN a common approach to, to biodiversity provides us with uh, for UN collaboration on biodiversity. And uh, thank you so much, Paola, for your excellent moderation of this session. And last but not least, I'd like to thank my colleagues in UN Habitat, including Andrew, Tina Pastore, Eleonora Dobles and Joy Mutai, as well as my colleagues in the EMG Secretariat, Felipe Chamiso, 
Olivia Kensington and Emma Mericanto for the hard work that they have dedicated to preparing this webinar, including its smooth implementation. And as you've already heard, this is the first uh, of webinar in a series that the EMG is organizing together with its members uh, to support knowledge sharing and facilitating exchange of good practices and also highlighting opportunities for further collaboration in the context of uh, implementing this common approach to, to biodiversity. Our next session will be on agri-food systems and biodiversity in May, and we will communicate the date for that soon. Uh, we invite you to follow the upcoming sessions that we will be marketing through different EMG communication channels, including the EMG website. And with these uh, quick concluding words, um, I'd like to thank you all for your time uh, to participate and actively engage in this session. We look forward to seeing you in our upcoming webinars. Thank you so much and wishing you all either a good rest of, of the working day or a good end of the day. Thanks so much. Bye bye. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you.